Hi, Bart. So I was wondering what you thought about blood tests and which ones you believe are the most useful based on your experience, um, which make the most sense to you, um, especially for those of the people that are following the carnivore diet? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's an interesting one. It's one that there are a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas um, giving advice on bloods, blood tests, etc. Routine testing, that is. I have to say I am not a fan at all of routine blood testing, mostly because the standard array of tests available that any given person could generally go to the NHS or whatever and say, I want um, a standard panel of bloods on this aspect, that aspect, and the other aspect. Most of those tests are completely useless worthless and will not provide any information of utility. It's a waste of time. The only time I suggest to a person that they ought to get specific blood tests done is if I suspect that there is a particular pathology or issue that that blood test would confirm for me. So if someone says, well, I just want to go and get a standard test on my bloods, I say, don't bother. Why would you? So that's, that's kind of my view on blood tests at large. So if a person is talking to me about how they're going, what they're experiencing, what they're going through, etc., and they come up with a bunch of signs and symptoms, which to me suggest, oh, it might be, their blood glucose is elevated, for example. Maybe they're eating too much protein, not enough fat, for example. Then I would send them for A1C, FBG, LFT, liver function test, um, GFR, EGFR, the glomerular filtration rate, Transferritin, not ferritin, transferritin, and in the case of a bloke, I might suggest something like get your total T and free T tested, maybe even your SBG, six binding globulin. Um, and that would probably be about it in terms of okay. yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess what you're kind of saying is um, without an obvious reason to have a test, you should not have a blood test. Yeah. So it's about doing what's needed rather than what you think you need. That's I guess. It. Yes. So tests are yeah. diagnostic and they're confirmatory or otherwise. If I'm trying to make a differential diagnosis, which is a process by which you eliminate that which is not possible. So if I think that this person has a problem with their glucose level and I get all those tests back and they all come back normal, then I've eliminated that possibility. And we can look mm. deeper for the next possible cause of their symptomology. Um, but yeah, if someone just, just comes to me and says, oh, I just want to get my blood tested, I just want to see how things are going, I generally say, well, how do you feel? Do you feel like things are going okay? Yep, great, we're done. We don't need any blood tests then. Okay, I see. So with that being said, are there any sort of things that you notice more commonly than others when it comes to people's blood tests? So is there a frequency of people having liver damage, kidney damage, things like that? Um, high blood glucose, you know? Yeah, it's pretty rare to find someone that really genuinely has liver damage or kidney function issues unless they've been unwell for some time. And they would probably know they've been unwell for some time. Um, it sometimes comes back problematic in a client who is very, very over fat and has been for many years before seeking the advice. Um, you, you're going to get fatty liver showing up or you know someone that's been an alcoholic you get fatty liver in that case quite often as well 
The other, the other group of people that you find fatty liver in, and they never expect it, is people that have been eating a lot of fruit, because fruit's healthy, you know, and suddenly they've got a whacking great case of, of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. How did that happen? I've been so good. I've been so healthy. I've been eating my fruit, so I have. Well, there you go. Fructose. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So It's crazy the dogma that comes into it all and how it can affect yeah, I mean, our you get that. best to understand it. You get that sometimes. The most common thing that I'm experiencing in people who already are carnivore is that they will come to me because they've had an aberrant testosterone reading for which the first thing I'm going to do is say, great, let's have a look at your transferritin level. As I said before, not ferritin, not standard ferritin testing. You have to ask specifically for transferritin. And if that comes back elevated, there's the reason for your... Um, there's a reason for your problem, probably. What I normally do in that case is I say, go and get your transferritin checked. And while you're there, let's have a look at your sex hormone binding globulin as well. And what you'll find is that if the transferritin is elevated, that interferes with the function of the sex binding hormone in such a way as to decrease the, the free testosterone, and that's what they have detected on the low testosterone test. The solution is very, very modern. It's bloodletting. Exactly the same as what you would give to someone with one of these genetic disorders leading to, to too much iron, such as hemochromatosis, or paradoxically certain forms of thalassemias, et cetera. And, and various anemia disorders actually can lead to an elevated transferritin, um, which would seem paradoxical, but that's what happens. And so mm. the answer is bloodletting. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Um, so do you find that there's any, I wouldn't really say useless, but perhaps less useful blood tests or things which people, doctors, practitioners typically test for, but it doesn't really give yeah. much indication. Or are there any standout ones for you? Yes. Any and all of your lipid panel tests, all completely useless, all completely worthless. I wouldn't bother even looking at any of those things. So we're talking cholesterol. We're talking triglycerides. We're talking triglyceride to LDL ratio. We're talking about LDL, HDL components, APOB, particle size, the whole lot. All of the lipid tests, worthless. They will not supply you with any information of utility by way of predicting your health outcomes, short, medium, or long term. Waste of time. So I would ditch every single one of those tests before you even bother. Or are there any scans on that note that are useful? Um, maybe you can do a CAC scan if you want to see if there's any advanced atherosclerosis, any any calcified atherosclerosis going on. That will not pick up soft lesions, only calcified ones. Yeah. So what you'd do is you'd get a CAC scan and probably an ultrasound to look at both soft and calcified plaques. Again, you would only suggest a person gets that testing done if there are signs of coronary artery occlusion, excuse me, such as, you know, maybe they have chest pain that comes and goes periodically um, that, is exacerbated by exercise. Maybe they have no exercise tolerance. Maybe they feel chronically tired. Maybe their pallor is a bit off, they're a bit pale. They, they look a bit vegan, maybe. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, then you'd probably say, well, we should probably have a look at this. 
That said, I do need to caveat all of that with if anyone ever presents to you with crushing chest pain, grey colour rather than just pale or even blue, any pain at all radiating down the left arm whatsoever, guess what? That's an emergency and we call emergency services at that stage. That's not all. Let's go and get some blood tests at some point. Okay? That's as distinct from what I was talking about a few minutes ago with the tightness sensation, the, the exercise intolerance, probably sweaty, might even be cold to the touch, you know, all of that stuff. Mm, let's have a look. Let's let's see if you've got some occlusion going on there. Um, yeah. So then you do it. I mean, the reason I'm saying you don't just go and get a CAC test done routinely is because there is a significant dose of RADS involved in it. For it's, the audience, what are they? It's 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 radiation. It's it's the yeah. X-rays and things that are that are being used. It's vastly more radiation than you're exposed to in a standard X-ray because a standard X-ray is paying one shot to have a look to see if you've got broken bones or whatever. The CAC scan is many, many slices through the cardiac region to build up a 3D image, whereas an X-ray is a 2D shot just to see if there's a broken bone. So it's a significant dose of radiation. You don't just go and get a CAC test because why not? I just want to know. No. Not a good idea. Oh, I see. I did not know that. Mm. Yeah. Things you learn there. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you actually go and, and to most NHS, for example, run facilities and say, I'd like a CAC scan, the first thing they'll ask you is, how old are you? And if you're not over 50, they'll say, bugger off. We're not doing it. Unless mm. you present as morbidly obese or you tell them you've been on a carnivore diet for 10 years, then they'll probably do it for you. Because, of course, that'll so that's the way to get, um, <clears throat> yeah. that's the way to get, get blood tests done. Yeah, I've but, been following a diet of mm. meat, fatty, meat heavy, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for that explanation. I appreciate that. Cool. 